Ray Dalio says it took more than great returns to turn Bridgewater Associates into the world's largest hedge fund. It took principles, prescriptive rules for life and business that Dalio established over four decades. The principles are what make Bridgewater unique and unusual. Now, Dalio has published them in a book along with his life story. I sat down with Ray Dalio at Bridgewater's campus in Westport, Connecticut. Ray, this is your book. I read your book. It's provocative at the very least. It's full of great ideas. It's the one place where I found them in one place. Why'd you write it? Uh, because these principles, everything that I learned uh, is in the book. Um, I'm at a stage in my life um, in which I'm transitioning <clears throat> from what I'll call the second stage of my life, which is when one tries to be successful and others are dependent on oneself, to the third stage in life in which the greatest joy that I can have is to watch other people be successful. And over these years, I accumulated a bunch of principles that helped me be successful, and I just wanted to pass them along. Um, they were built over many years at Bridgewater because I was making decisions and I was reflecting on them and I wanted to pass them along. It's unusual at the very least for someone in your position, someone managing $160 billion of investments, someone helping to run a company of Bridgewater's size to write a book like this. How did you find the time? Well, you know, I've been writing these principles down for, I don't know, 20 years because I got in the habit, which is a habit, by the way, I'd recommend to you or anybody else, to whenever I was faced with a decision, to think what are my criteria for making those decisions and then to write them down, because the same things happen to us over and over again, right? And so particularly if I'm making mistakes and learning, I, it was a good exercise. And then eventually I put some of these things into uh, algorithms to make our investment process. So I found that over the period of time I accumulated that, uh, those principles. And then uh, I didn't feel good about putting the principles out, generally speaking, but um, in 2008 when we caught the financial crisis and uh, we got attention, some people gave us uh, attention and I didn't want the attention, um, but I felt that it wasn't understood, the principles of our company that have made us successful. And so I put them out on a website, and they were downloaded three million times, and I received all sorts of thank you notes because people found them helpful. And then the time came where I thought, I now gather all these together, and in my transition from that second phase to the third phase, I wanted to put it out. So that's how they developed. And so you'd say, what, what was, how long did it take to write the book? I don't know. It took a long time to get the principles you know, it took a lifetime of uh, trial and error. But there's more than just the principles. There's your own personal story. There is the explanation behind the principles. Um, the th thing about it that I w was reluctant to write that personal part because I don't want people to pay attention to me or somebody's story. That's, they make it too, you know, okay, this is Ray Dalio's story. I like people to look be through those pr principles you know, through me to the principles and say that the principles themselves make sense. So if in fact that's what happens, people read your story, find it interesting, but look through it ultimately to your life principles and your work principles, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, I just hope that people will assess those principles and see are they useful. I hope that they will form their own principles. What principles work for them? Is that the most important part? Oh, that's the most important part. In other words, there's a certain power of having principles that, that suit you and that you know and that you can clearly communicate. And I think that that's true today. In other words, what does it mean to be principled? Did you articulate your principles? Um, are you clear? Are you straight? Can you walk the talk? Today in our society, um, I hope that it will encourage people to be more principled. So I'm encouraging other people to put out their principles. I won't give you the names, but I spoke to a number of other people and I, I want them to put out their principles. Because I think when I look back, wouldn't I have liked to know what Albert Einstein's principles were or were uh, 
or Steve Jobs, what were the recipes that led to their successes? What were they going after? And if we had everybody write their principles down and you could look at it, those are sort of recipes. Wouldn't it be nice to have everybody's recipes? Because I could have learned from other people's recipes. You describe systems and processes, even companies and economies for that matter, as machines. Machines is an unusual word. Why machines? Well, I think that to think of it, the human body is a gorgeous machine. It's like our brains as gorgeous machines. It shows that how they have, how they develop, how they have a uh, cause-effect relationships. And I think we're all, the whole ecosystem is a machine. When we start to think about that, we can think about how do we interact with the machine? How do we influence the machine? How do we make the machine work for us? So I'm talking about reality. Okay. There are th three things you need to do in order to be successful, right? I mean, well, most importantly, you have to know what the best decisions are and then you have to have the courage to make them. And so when you look at those uh, choices that you have, you have to be able to deal with reality. And if you f just view it as a machine and not something that's happening to you that you don't own, I think it helps give you it's a easier. psychology. It helped me. You know, cause-effect relationship. How does this machine work? It's, uh... But anyway, whatever the term is that uh, you're comfortable with, when you realize it is kind of a machine, right? Bridgewater Associates was a consulting firm when Ray Dalio founded it in his two-bedroom New York City apartment. Today, the hedge fund has more than 1,500 employees worldwide and some $160 billion in assets. You've been working at this for, since 1975. It's a long time. How close would you say Bridgewater is to being, if you will, the perfect machine? Uh, you know, I don't know. Perfect is, uh, there's so many years, uh, there's so many development. I don't, I don't, it's, you know, it's a tough question to answer. Um, I think, you know, I don't know, halfway there or... <laughs> I, 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 I don't know how to answer the question. Well, let's, really. let's think about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. What's left to do? What's left to improve? How could it be better? It's like um, DNA. You know, we individually, our responsibilities were vessels for our DNA, but the DNA continues. So when I think of Bridgewater, I think that there, it's as much the next generation and the next generation after that, and it's cause-effect relationships. And so I think that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a multi, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> but we're just coming, if you will, toward the end of the first generation? Is that where we are in Bridgewater's lifespan? Yeah. We're at the end of the first generation, and that's the beauty of it. That's the transition. You know, uh, what I mean is, for me to have watched the development of the people that I'm working with, uh, Bob Prince, 31 years, Greg Jensen, 21 years, um, hundreds of people. And I feel like a parent of a 40-year-old. And to watch that transition is a beautiful thing. To watch them succeed is a, such a beautiful thing. So it, yes, it's, it's the transition from one generation to the second generation and to see it as a perpetual motion machine. It's nice to hear someone in your position talk about his company and his employees as if they were part of a family. But people from the outside look at Bridgewater differently. And you've been very sensitive to some of those comments and criticisms and perhaps misperceptions. How would you describe this company? Bridgewater is an idea meritocracy in which the goal is to have meaningful work and meaningful relationships and to do that through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. So, okay, idea meritocracy. The best ideas went out. Um, meaningful work. You're on a mission together. You, um, you have impact. Meaningful relationships. In other words, like an extended family. That, that power of being in it together and realizing that the reward of the relationship is just as great as the reward of the uh, 
success of the business, but to do that by having radical truthfulness. In other words, that you can say what you believe and I can say what we, I believe and that we can have processes in place to have thoughtful disagreement to get past our disagreements. And that radical transparency is the ability for people to see everything so that they don't have uh, second-hand or third-hand stories. I mean, to me, when I look at a company, most companies, uh, it looks disingenuous. And it can, well, all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, um, you know, uh, people don't say what they really think. There's all of the, the office politics. They don't know what the real story is because there's so much spin. Imagine if you can get to see everything. In other words, for most everything, it's taped for everybody to see so they can see things firsthand. To know that people can't talk behind your backs without you hearing it so that it's operated on a first-hand basis. I mean, I think that's what Bridgewater is. It's an idea meritocracy. So in order to have an idea meritocracy, you have to do three things. The first is you have to put your honest thoughts on the table. Most organizations, people are reluctant to be honest. Okay, you have to put your honest thoughts on the table and not be offended if people do. The second is that you have to have thoughtful disagreement. In other words, you respect the fact that somebody has disagreement and that you are curious about that and you have a quality back and forth so that you can ideally come up with a better decision than you would individually because you're open-minded. Not that uh, disagreement is a source of fighting, but so disagreement is a source of coming together. And then the third thing is that you have to be able to get past disagreements in an idea meritocratic way if, you, if they remain, because they're still going to remain. And in order to do that, um, you have to have some kind of process. We have believability-weighted decision-making. There's a lot about Bridgewater you won't find at other hedge funds. Ray Dalio designed it to be an idea meritocracy and says the key is a process he calls believability-weighted decision-making. I should explain believability-weighted decision-making to you if, you, sure. if you're interested. Uh, I think I have an idea about what it means, but go ahead. Um, okay, so ordinarily, you know, there are two ways of making decisions, pretty much. Uh, there's the boss has control. And so autocratic. Autocratic. Right. I'll call that autocratic. Takes in everything and then he makes a decision. Or there's democratic, pretty much. One man, one vote. Um, but really, the best decision making is believability weighted decision making. And if you think about it first conceptually, you would say, um, if you're going to make a decision of what you, you have a medical condition. And you're going, how are you going to get that? You're going to think, who are the best doctors? Consult the experts, right? Consult the experts. But this one knows more and that one knows more, less. And how do you do it? And then you have this triangulation. And then you make that. That's kind of the idea of believability decision making. We have ways of uh, signing believability that we all agree are fair, that we each assess each other. And we get certain amount of believability points. So now imagine that you had believability, your believability on a subject matter. Maybe it's investing, maybe it's accounting, whatever the subject is, that you have a certain amount of believability weighted points and you're together. Well, those believability weighted points, uh, when you say, okay, what should I make as a decision? Now I'm responsible for something, but I ask everybody else, I, and I take a believability weighted vote. I can have a believability weighted vote. When I have that believability way to vote, I really do believe that it's going to be a better decision than I would individually make. That's believability way to decision making.